NASA's SpaceX Crew-2 astronauts safely splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida on November 8 aboard the Crew Dragon Endeavour spacecraft, completing the agency's second long-duration commercial crew mission to the International Space Station. The Crew-2 mission was launched on April 23 on a Falcon 9 rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Crew Dragon Endeavour docked to the Harmony module's forward port of the space station on April 24, nearly 24 hours after liftoff. Throughout their 199 days mission, the Crew-2 astronauts contributed to a host of science and maintenance activities, scientific investigations, and technology demonstrations. In addition, they conducted four spacewalks and multiple public engagement events while aboard the orbiting laboratory. During the return trip the spacecraft undocked from the station's Harmony module and spent the next two hours performing a fly-around of the station, making a loop of the station from a distance of about 200 meters. Peskett took photos of the station from a window in the Crew Dragon during the maneuver as part of a reconnaissance of the station's exterior. The spacecraft's re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere went as planned, culminating in a parachute-assisted splashdown off the coast of Florida. Within about an hour, crews aboard SpaceX recovery vessels successfully recovered the spacecraft and astronauts. After returning to shore, the astronauts flew back to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Crew Dragon Endeavour was returned for inspection and processing to SpaceX's Dragon Lair in Florida, where teams will examine the spacecraft's data and performance throughout the flight. Two days after the Crew-2 return, a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center on November 10, carrying four astronauts to the International Space Station. The launch took place following a series of delays due to poor weather and a minor medical issue that popped up with one of the crew members. This launch marks the fifth crewed space flight by SpaceX, dating back to the Demo-2 commercial crew test flight that launched in May 2020. On November 11, less than 24 hours after its launch from Florida, the Crew Dragon Endurance spacecraft carrying NASA astronauts Raja Chari, Tom Marshburn, Kayla Barron, and European Space Agency astronauts Matthias Moore docked into the forward port of the station's Harmony module. The spacecraft went through a handful of checks before the hatch was opened, and the crew joined the astronauts on board the station. With the Crew-3 arrival, it brings the total number of people on board the space station to seven. Please check out our previous video to learn more about the Crew-3 mission, link in the description. SpaceX's next crewed mission to the space station will be Crew-4, which is currently set to lift off in April 2022. Starlink, SpaceX's Internet from Space program, has unveiled a new rectangular dish that interested consumers can purchase to connect to the company's low-Earth orbit satellite constellation. It's a lighter and thinner version of the circular dish that Starlink beta testers have been using for the past year. The original version is a standard dish that's 58.9 cm wide, but the rectangular version is only 30 cm wide and 50 cm long. The new terminal's smaller form factor could give users more options when it comes to potential locations where they can install it. In addition, the rectangular terminal comes with more accessory options, including a long pole that users can simply stick in the ground so they no longer have to mount the antenna on their rooftop. The company's website notes that the rectangular dish comes with a new 3x3 multi-user, multiple input, multiple output router, which does not come with a built-in Ethernet port like its predecessor. However, SpaceX is offering an Ethernet adapter for purchase on the Starlink shop. The new Starlink kit weighs 8.5 kilograms, nearly 5 kilograms less than the original 13.6 kilograms kit. The current $499 Starlink dish will expensive, as actually being sold at a significant loss for the company. Originally, the dish cost $3,000 to produce, meaning the company was selling to users at a loss. However, SpaceX President Gwynne Shotwell claimed in April that SpaceX was able to reduce that number to around $1,300. SpaceX claims that the rectangular Starlink dish is currently available for all new orders fulfilled in the United States. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket carried 53 Starlink Internet satellites into orbit in a foggy flight on November 13. The previously flown Falcon 9 rocket booster, B1058, blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on Saturday, marking the company's 23rd launch of the year. The successful liftoff marked the first SpaceX Starlink launch from Florida in six months and the ninth flight of this particular booster. The launch attempt came just 24 hours after SpaceX was forced to delay the mission due to stormy conditions at the Cape. About nine minutes after liftoff, the rocket's first stage returned to Earth, touching down on SpaceX's drone ship for a successful landing. 
15 minutes and 45 seconds after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage released all 53 Starlink satellites into a 337km orbit at an inclination of 53.2 degrees to the equator. The satellites were the second batch of SpaceX's recently upgraded Starlink Internet satellites, which are now equipped with intra-satellite laser communications. According to Elon Musk, inter-satellite laser communications can carry data at the speed of light in the vacuum all around Earth before touching the ground. And over time, communication can be established from one user terminal to another without touching the Internet. With Saturday's successful launch, SpaceX has lofted 1,844 Starlink satellites into orbit, and the company has official approval for thousands more. NASA announced that the agency is pushing back the target date of Artemis II and Artemis III missions, the second and third scheduled missions of NASA's Artemis program. Artemis II will be the first crewed mission to travel beyond low Earth orbit since Apollo 17 in 1972. The mission, which was earlier scheduled to launch in 2023, will now occur in May 2024. During the 10-day mission, the crewed Orion spacecraft will perform a lunar flyby test and return to Earth. Artemis III, which aims to put the first woman and the first person of color on the moon, will occur no earlier than 2025. The 30-day mission was previously scheduled for launch in 2024. NASA blames the delay on the legal challenge mounted by Blue Origin to the agency's selection of SpaceX for a human landing system, as well as changes to the scope of some of NASA's programs in the COVID-19 pandemic. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said that the agency and SpaceX needed more time to review the state of the Artemis III program before committing to a more specific schedule for the mission. The first launch of the Artemis program, Artemis I, which NASA recently said would fly early next year, will mark the debut of the Space Launch System rocket. The launch vehicle will carry an uncrewed Orion capsule around the moon on a 26-day trip, demonstrating the vehicles are safe and capable of carrying people. NASA's Mars Helicopter Ingenuity has soared through the red planet skies yet again. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory announced on November 8 that the Little Chopper had recently completed its 15th Martian sortie. The Mars helicopter flew for 128.8 seconds, covering a distance of 406 meters. The copter attained a maximum altitude of 12 meters and a maximum velocity of 5 meters per second. The flight is first in a series of four to seven flights to return the helicopter to Wright Brothers Field, the site of the rotorcraft's first ever Martian flight. The recent flight was also the second in which Ingenuity spun its rotors at 2,700 revolutions per minute, compared to 2,500 RPM on the first 13 flights. The Hubble Space Telescope has been in safe mode since October 23, with all of the science instruments offline and unavailable for observations. However, engineers have now been able to bring one instrument, the Advanced Camera for Surveys, back online and have restarted its science observations. NASA said engineers are still investigating the issue as the other four instruments remain offline. Safe mode is designed to keep the telescope stable and allow it to remain powered via its solar panels while the engineering team works through the technical issues. The underlying cause appears to be a synchronization error, which means the instruments could not sync up to collect data properly. NASA said that the mission team has continued investigating the root cause of the synchronization issues over the past week and has seen no additional problems. The team will continue looking into possible short-term solutions this week and develop estimates for implementation. Japan launched a small low-cost Epsilon rocket on November 9 in the latest attempt to promote involvement by educational institutions and companies in space development. The Epsilon-5 rocket lifted off from Uchinaura Space Center in Kagoshima Prefecture at around 10 a.m. on Tuesday. The rocket, which measures 2.6 meters in diameter and 26 meters in length carried nine satellites to orbit, the most for a mission using an Epsilon rocket. One of the satellites aboard, Rapid Innovative Payload Demonstration Satellite No. 2, developed by Mitsubishi Electric Corporation, will test six different space technologies, including a small sensor called MARIN, designed to gauge the position, altitude, and velocity of orbiting satellites. The debris removal unprecedented microsatellite, a 62-kilogram spacecraft that will test strategies for gathering particles of space debris and removing them from the space environment, is the largest of the Tagalongs. Drums, built by Kawasaki Heavy Industries, will deploy a small target sub-satellite, which it will then move away from before returning to rendezvous using automated visual navigation systems. Within two hours after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage released all nine satellites one by one as scheduled to an altitude of about 600 kilometers, successfully completing the mission. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. 
SpaceX achieved a new milestone on Friday, November 12, when the company briefly ignited all of Starship 20's Raptor engines for the first time during a static fire test at Starbase. The stainless steel Ship 20 prototype is equipped with three vacuum-optimized Raptors designed for propulsion in outer space and three sea-level Raptor engines designed for atmospheric flight, and it's the first time the prototype simultaneously lit all those six engines. Although it is unclear whether all six Raptor engines were operated at full throttle, depending on the efficiency of its 3R vac engines at sea level, during a full throttle static fire, Starship 26 Raptor version 1 engines could produce approximately 10.8 MN of thrust. The static fire test that took place on Friday was Ship 20's third static fire test campaign. The prototype had previously conducted two back-to-back -back static fire tests on October 21. Just like what happened on October 21, a few more heat shield tiles of Ship 20 fell off the ship during Friday's test. According to Musk, this is not a big deal, and SpaceX expects some tiles to shake loose during static fires. About 52 minutes before the static fire test, the ship performed a different kind of hot fire test, completing what is known as a pre-burner test. The turbopumps on the Raptor engines were verified during the test to ensure they were working properly. As is customary, these events were filmed in high definition from numerous viewpoints by Lab Padre's live stream cameras. According to CEO Elon Musk, Friday's test went as expected. The test was a watershed moment for the space company, setting the stage for Starship's maiden voyage into orbit. The timing of that liftoff is unclear, partly because the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration is still conducting an environmental assessment of the Starbase orbital launch site. The FAA has filed a draft assessment and collected public comments on the document, but the final report has not yet been released. Now, we wait until Starship 20 gets to sit on top of its super heavy booster for the second time. SpaceX will conduct a static fire test of its Booster 4 prototype prior to any orbital launch. Meanwhile, when the road was closed on Friday, two self-propelled modular transporters carried the Super Heavy Booster Test Tank BN 2.1 and GSE Test Tank No. 4 to the launch site. Both test tanks will be subjected to cryogenic pressure testing at the launch site in the coming weeks. Booster Test Tank 2.1 had previously completed cryoproof tests on June 8 and 17, and GSE Tank 4 had completed its first round of cryoproof tests on August 25. Pressure tests of the test tanks are expected to take place as early as Wednesday, November 17. Reeving of steel cables through the pulleys installed on the orbital launch tower is progressing. Let us analyze the reeving process with the help of this illustration from Lunar Caveman. The drawworks mechanism installed on the orbital launch tower consists of a traveling block, which is basically a five-sheave pulley. The carriage of the booster catching arm will be attached to the traveling block. The supply reel supplies steel cable through the deadline anchor, which is used to tie down the cable line and measure the load suspended. The cable will pass through the crown block and the traveling block before moving towards the drawworks through a series of pulleys. The drawworks employed at Starbase is a National Oil Well Varco ADS-30Q drawworks, which has four motors, each with a rated output power of 1,500 horsepower. The machine includes two disc brakes with a diameter of 1.2 meters to act as a parking brake when no motion is desired. These brakes could be used to position the booster catching mechanism at the desired location, and later the brakes can be released to lower the booster. The apparatus is equipped with gears for speed reduction and can handle approximately 1,245 tons of load. The Lieber LR11000 crawler crane, nicknamed Bucky, was decommissioned at the launch site on November 6, and parts were taken to the build site in the following days. The crane was later reassembled and erected at the build site to help with the construction of the new wide bay. Construction of the new wide bay near the existing high bay is progressing rapidly. As of November 12, 16 columns and 60 beams have been added to the structure. The complex also received 29 outer ridges and approximately 330 cladding supports. The first level of the wide bay is almost complete, and construction of the second level will begin in the coming days. Recently, inside the high bay, the aft dome section of Booster 5, which will house the 29 Raptor engines of the booster, was mated with the oxygen tank section of the booster. Booster 5 is now one stack away from structural completion, and the methane tank section stacking could happen this week. Meanwhile, the nose cone section of Ship 21 was recently stacked on top of the barrel section, and inside the mid-bay, the propellant tank sections of Ship 21 are being prepped for stacking. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section.
Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.